Fred, thank you very much for those uh, very kind words. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a very great honor to uh, uh, be able to participate in the Niarchos Lecture Series. It's very uh, humbling to hear the uh, very illustrious names that have uh, gone before me. And of course, it goes without saying, uh, I deeply regret the circumstances that uh, brought me here today instead of Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Uh, however, as uh, first, as Fred has said, uh, the fund is a deep, talented, and resilient uh, institution. Uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, in his years as managing director, provided uh, tremendous leadership, but it was leading an extremely competent and dedicated team that I now have the honor to lead until a new managing director is chosen. And I am completely confident that the institution will be able to fulfill all its obligations, responsibilities, and roles fully in uh, such time as transpires until a new managing director is named. Parenthetically, I'm the third first managing director of the IMF. All three of us have spent some time as acting managing director. This seems to come with the territory. But let me add uh, one other note why I'm here. Also, as uh, to honor Fred and the, uh, and the Peterson Institute and the uh, seminal work that uh, Fred and his colleagues have done to keep international economic policy issues uh, front and center in, uh, in this capital and this country and around the world. Uh, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, leading, one of the leading uh, institutions of its kind anywhere. Uh, it's wonderful that it's here, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm honored uh, for this reason as well to be here. Now, I have a presentation on global recovery and global cooperation. I hope you'll able to, you're able to see the slides. Uh, if not, there's going to be a, a bit of a problem, uh, but I hopefully uh, you'll be, uh, uh, this, will, this will still work. Uh, I'm going to be talking about global recovery and global cooperation. As uh, Fred said, this has been a particular area of concern of mine at the IMF, and uh, it strikes me that even among this distinguished and informed audience that there is uh, uh, probably worthwhile making sure you understand the details of what is going on in the effort of, co of cooperative, of policy cooperation in an effort to boost the uh, global economic recovery. That's going to be the topic of my uh, prepared remarks this evening. Uh, subsequently, we're going to have question and answer, and I simply want to signal that I'll be very happy to address uh, any issue of, uh, that you wish, uh, you wish me to in, at that time. So, let's start. Well, I think at this, in this institution, it's uh, uh, obvious, and perhaps everybody knows, the world has become more interconnected and more complex. Sounds like a platitude. But let's uh, look at some maps and just get an idea of how this, uh, these developments of interconnection also add complexity and also led to where we are today. Let's start with a geographic map of the world. Needs no introduction. Now let's transform it and see what happens if we redraw it not on the basis of geography, but of GDP. Take a look. It may be just a little bit surprising. It's based on market values. We see the U.S. very large. We see Europe very large. We see Japan very large. And some of the fastest growing economies are still not so large. They're very important in terms of growth, but this is a snapshot of global GDP. Now let's transform this into trade. Hmm. Different. Europe, and especially parts of Europe, very large. Japan, very large. Frankly, places like Australia and Canada, 
that uh, have a fairly large place in our mindset, despite rather small populations, uh, relatively large here. Other places, uh, much smaller, much smaller. A very different picture than if we looked at GDP. Now, let's look at finance. And yet, another reality. The US, very large. Europe, very large. Asia, well, quite small, actually. Latin America, quite small, actually. Africa, hardly there, actually. It's a different view of the world. So imagine the interrelations of these different layers adds complexity and is one of the reasons we let, that led to policy failures and eventually policy success. What do I mean by that? What were the failures? The failures that created the crisis of 2008 and 2009. We could characterize them many ways, and I'm sure they've been discussed here endlessly in this very room. But certainly they include failures of command and control systems in the private sector as well as in the public sector. And one way to characterize the failures was the failures to grasp macrofinancial linkages the interconnections, financial interconnections, that were not seen clearly to begin with, and their relations to economic activity that was not seen clearly, that produced a thunderclap in the global economy in 2008 and produced a deep recession. That was the policy failure. And by policy here, as I said, emphasize, I meant broadly, public, and private. What about the success? Well, the success, I would say, were the successes were twofold. The success was the elemental development of increasing globalization and increasing interconnectedness, which in fact has produced over time uh, the strongest period of global growth. In, uh, in world history. In the past decade, produced growth that produced dramatic reductions in poverty and that continue to produce dramatic improvements in, uh, in the well-being of hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people. And drawing on the lessons of the Commission on Growth and Development led by uh, Michael Spence, that showed that in all cases of an escape from poverty in developing countries and emerging economies involved a period of strong and sustained growth in every case. And in every case, every period of strong and sustained growth was a result of economies that opened to the world at large. There's no counterexample. That's one broad success. But the other more specific success of the crisis was in contrast to the Great Depression in which countries acted in their own self-interest. There was a coming together of this globalized world to act in unison to resist the downturn. And as a result, the downturn lasted only three quarters. From the third quarter of 2008, the second quarter of 2009, and by the th second quarter of 2009, global growth was positive again. Uh, quite an astonishing uh, result considering the challenges. So we got out of the deep hole we started to fall into. And now, however, we face a set of new policy challenges of how to reestablish strong, sustained, and balanced growth. So let's take a look at the specific nature 
of the challenges. Here's a very simple graph. It shows you GDP growth rates 2005 through 2012 using the IMF's World Economic Outlook forecast. We're all familiar with this. Green on top, the emerging world. Blue on the bottom, the advanced economies. Red, global, a global average, global growth. We're familiar with that, but let's take a less familiar look. And let's say, what if we just got rid of those, that ugly part in the middle? And if we could just forget about 2008 and 2009, that's what the record would look like. And you'd say, pretty good. That looks pretty good. What's the problem? The problem is, that's what actually happened. So we fell into this hole. But now we're growing back at the rate we were before. But don't we, in the advanced economies, don't we have to grow faster to make up for the hole that we fell into? But it's not happening. What's the result? We all know. Next. Unemployment in the advanced economies. Higher than we, we've seen, higher than we'd like. And not just overall unemployment rates, there's an aspect that perhaps doesn't get uh, enough attention, and that is youth unemployment in a stagnant uh, economy. New entrants to the job market are finding very limited success. We've all heard and paid attention to the notion that high, youth, high, rate, youth, high rates of youth unemployment in the MENA region led to great social tension. Well, it's not so dramatic here, in a way, in absolute terms, but in relative terms, it's not something that we would want to sustain and try to live with. But that's not all. The other, another challenge that we face is one partly a creation of the crisis, but partly a creation of our combination of demographics and the kind of promises that our, our uh, governments have made to our citizens in advanced economies. Here is a portrayal of the amount of fiscal adjustment that would be, will, be, will need to be made under the presumption that over the next uh, 20 years, adjustment is made to stabilize or return debt levels to where they were pre-crisis. It's a simple, the simple point is virtually every advanced economy faces a need for substantial uh, adjustment in fiscal policies. And uh, I'm sure if Pete Peterson were, had arrived, he would be smiling and saying, what took everyone so long to figure this out? But the truth is, this has been a, the kind of problem that we're able to say, yes, we know it's coming someday. The crisis led to an increase in debt to GDP ratios of 25 to 30 percent on average in the advanced economies over the last three years. So that problem that was out in the distance is now staring us right in the face. That's the advanced economies. The uh, emerging economies we saw are growing much more rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that even though we all agree, at least we all think we agree, that these economies have, are enjoying much stronger rates of potential growth than in the past. Uh, Nonetheless, by our calculations, many of the emerging, key emerging economies are, oops, that's premature, are out of, uh, out of room in terms of excess capacity. On the right, we can see by our estimates, some are even operating above potential. Those little buttons are now supposed to appear, and they show you where policy interest rates are in each one of those economies. In virtually every single case, policy rates are negative in real terms. How'd they get there? 
Well, they were put there in 2008, 2009 to resist the crisis. Not only, but the crisis is over, especially for the emerging economies, but policies, are, their monetary policies remain expansionary. Not surprisingly, that's produced an effect on credit growth. And you can see on the right, everywhere, uh, virtually everywhere except in China where there's been a slowdown from a, an extremely rapid pace, uh, credit growth rates remain elevated and in many cases accelerating. Well, so in that case, you're certainly not surprised to find that one of the fantastic accomplishments of the emerging economies is uh, now potentially uh, under pressure. This shows you the average CPI inflation in the, emerged econ in the emerging economies from 1995 to the present. A spectacular result because if we took this, if we took this uh, chart back to previous years, previous decades, wouldn't necessarily be all the way up at 50 percent, but it would be close enough for government work. And the decline to the under uh, the five to seven percent is not only one of the dramatic achievements of policy improvement in the emerging economies, but is one of the reasons why investment in emerging economies is beginning to seem like such an attractive proposition. I could show you government debt to GDP ratios and it would show you a similar story. Deficits in the emerging economies lower than in the advanced economies. Debt to GDP ratios in the emerging economies lower than in the advanced economies. Prospects, no demographic in general in the emerging economies, no evidence of the same demographic pressures that will that face the uh, fiscal accounts in the uh, emerging economies, uh, the advanced economies, excuse me. But, and here's the but, that's a terrific record, but right now, right now, headline inflation in the emerging economies is rising. If we put a little magnifying glass there, you'll see that after a long period of downturn, a brief blip in 2007-2008 in response to the previous run-up in uh, uh, commodity and energy prices, back down, now we're headed up again. What's the difference between 2007-2008? It's just as I showed you already. These economies are close to or out of excess capacity. Their policy, their fiscal and monetary policies are expansionary. Credit growth is very rapid and inflation is rising. So it's not just commodity and energy price inflation. Let's take a look at what's happened to inflation expectations. Here, for chance for the, for the BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Here is where inflation expectations were six months ago. And we can say, well, okay, kind of sort of consistent with recent averages. Here are those same figures today. It, so we see that in, in expectations are beginning to deteriorate. So what's called for? What's called for? We escape the downturn. We forge new, new means of cooperation. We've established growth, but we face substantial challenges, advanced and emerging economies. Clearly, it's a time for new policy cooperation. As it's clear that no single economy is going to be able to restore global balance and growth alone. So in the balance of my discussion today, I'd like to take a look at what is being done specifically in some detail at the IMF and then tell you a little bit about what's happening in the G20 and try to put it into a, a context, a logical context that I hope you will find useful. And then we'll come back at the end to see how this all might fit together. So first, although uh, that's the IMF, 
if, the, uh, if it was in high definition, you'd be impressed with the graphics. <laughs> and uh, we've made uh, uh, changes in four key areas. In surveillance, which is, of course, the unique responsibility of the IMF, surveillance over policies of our member countries. The instruments that we have available to support our members' uh, economies. The resources that we have available in support of those instruments. And not trivially, in a world of changing uh, relative economic importance, our governance uh, uh, structures. So let's look first at surveillance. What's happened? A whole series of innovations I'll go through quickly. Uh, you may know about them, but maybe not. The early warning exercise. That you don't know too much about other than having heard the name. Uh, we faced a, a problem at the fund. You're familiar with our World Economic Outlook, our Global Financial Stability Report, and now hopefully our Fiscal Monitor. They tell you what do we think our base case our best guess on the base case outlook is, is. And principal risks, risks that are relevant enough that you would take them into account in setting policy today. We didn't have any, any systematic way to communicate sense of, let's call them tail risks. Things that could occur, and if they occur, would, would force or would uh, justify a substantial policy reaction. The question is, what were those risks? How would you recognize them if they were emerging? What would you do about them if they were? That's what the early warning exercise is, and it's one we present to our, the International Monetary and Financial Committee, ministers and governors of the 24 countries represented by the seats in the executive uh, uh, board uh, twice a year. So that's a new means of communication, committing, communicating uh, risks. Second, FSAPs, financial sector assessment programs. They used to be voluntary. Now they're mandatory for all of our members with systemically important financial systems. Last year, we conducted FSAPs for the first time here in Washington and in Beijing. The former managing director, Rodrigo de Rato, mused one day, maybe if the FSAP had occurred earlier, maybe things could have been better. But in any case, a new uh, method of surveillance. And now we're in the midst of our latest uh, surveillance innovation spillover analysis. Uh, what is this? You might say, you mean it just occurred to the IMF staff that there might be spillovers between economies? No, it's not that. Here's what we're doing. We're taking the five systemically important economies in which we conduct annual uh, uh, consultation missions, the US, Japan, the UK, China, and the Euro area. We are going to each of these and asking their authorities about their views of how they're affected by the policies of each of the others. We're going to the economies and surrounding them, their partner economies, and asking the same question. We're putting this together in a coherent spillover report, and when we then conduct our annual consultation visits to the five systemic economies, we will be able to say, we've been talking to your partners, and here's what they think about what you're doing and how it's affecting them. A new element in the consultation process. Let's see. You will find uh, when we publish the uh, consultation reports, they will also contain the spillover reports. Let's see what insight this brings into the discussions about individual countries' uh, economic uh, uh, policies. We're doing work on macrofinancial linkages. Remember, I said failure to recognize. The specifics of macrofinancial linkages was one of the contributors to the crisis. And finally, we're paying more attention to the quality of growth as we ask ourselves are things like dis are considerations like distribution of income and unemployment rates, do they have effects on macroeconomic stability that is our uh, 
our traditional focus. We don't have answers, we don't, but we certainly have to be aware of the poten potential interlinkages. Now let's turn to instruments. What have we done? Here I can be brief because I suspect you know about them. First, in previous years our uh, stabilization programs had been criticized in being too complex, too many conditions, too much, trying to do too much. We streamlined our programs to make sure that they focus on the core issues relevant to the goals of reestablishing growth and stability. But perhaps more relevant in this context even is the rec was the recognition that the instruments, the financing instruments available to the IMF in the past had been designed in a different era, in an era of bank financing in an era in which the focus was crisis prevention, excuse me, crisis resolution. A crisis has happened, how do we cure it? Two things uh, had changed. One, the growth of global capital markets and the increasing dominance of cross-border capital flows in the, uh, in the context or in the form of sale and purchase of marketable securities, i.e. a capital markets world, meant that financial crises moved at lightning pace. It meant that if you wanted to do crisis prevention, you needed insurance-like instruments that would avoid a sense of asymmetrical risks in which, for example, an institutional investor holding a portfolio of securities in a given, of a given country would not think, if I, if I wait it out, I may get my coupon but if I've got it wrong, I'll lose my principal. When those risks appear, investors tend not to wait around to see the result. How do you prevent that? You need insurance-like facilities that provide liquidity in, in large scale when needed so that investors have confidence they won't face those kind of asymmetric risks. That's the flexible credit line and the precautionary credit line. They've been now uh, used, uh, uh, created uh, for several countries. They've never been drawn on. So far, so good. We're also uh, created cooperation, enhanced cooperation with regional financing arrangements to uh, uh, provide new kinds of, uh, of financing uh, instruments. Specifically, you may not think of it that way, but a year ago, you would have wondered what is the role of the IMF with regard to Euro area countries. That's been defined. The Euro area has created new financing arrangements. The EFSM that was pre-existed but now applied to Euro area countries and the EFSF, the, uh, the financing facility that issues uh, debt and to support uh, stabilization programs. We partnered with them in a, a very a symbiotic way. And we're looking forward to deepening our uh, cooperation with the Chiang Mai Initiative and its multilateral form. So we don't view these regional arrangements as competitors, we view them as potential partners. And finally, we're thinking about the global safety net. Has it really, uh, is it really adequate? Uh, for one, as you know, during the crisis, uh, short-term liquidity provision required a series of ad hoc, one-off actions by individual central banks. We have to ask whether perhaps there ought to be a multilateral focus with some kind of well-understood rules of the game and, uh, and availability, perhaps working in partnership uh, with central banks perhaps a facility that would be created or activated in a crisis situation, perhaps not. So here, again, we've made some important changes. Next, resources can be brief. You all know there was an agreement to double our quotas to about 767 billion. We've expanded, it's called the new arrangements to borrow. That means we can borrow more 
on relatively short notice from our members if we need more. Uh, probably uh, you may have noticed uh, that we were allowed to sell some of our gold to create a trust fund and that the uh, trust fund, although the trust fund uh, in the long term, as the uh, proceeds from the trust fund, in other words the interest from the trust fund, will help to finance the operations of the fund. For now we don't need it and we are able to devote those, those resources to providing additional subsidized support for our low income uh, country members. And uh, in total, uh, commitment of funds uh, since the crisis has been about $300 uh, billion. And here's a, hope you can see, uh, that may be a little too complicated, not visual enough, but uh, this shows you over time the, uh, uh, on the uh, horizontal, uh, uh, vertical axis shows you the decline in GDP that has occurred in uh, crisis countries that we've come to their aid in the form of financial support. The size of the, uh, these balloons represents a share of quota, percentage of quota, the horizontal uh, access time. The point is as we've gone forward, the uh, programs in the uh, more recently have become larger relative to overall quota. Those uh, 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 golden colored ones, I guess that's a good choice, show the use of our new innovative uh, flexible uh, credit line. The point here is as the crisis has moved, we've uh, figured out that we need to arrive with substantial resources. Now to go governance. Here again, I suspect you're all aware We've agreed last year, our members agreed, to shift about 6% of quota share to dynamic emerging market and uh, developing economies uh, from, and from uh, overrepresented, uh, by shifting from overrepresented to uh, underrepresented uh, members. We now have a situation when the 2010 uh, governance reforms are approved, the, the quota and voice reforms are approved. The top 10 shareholders of the IMF will be the US, Japan, the four largest Europeans, and the BRICS. And I would ask, can you think of a replacement of any one of those that would add to the legitimacy and representativeness of, uh, of our largest shareholders? I don't, I don't see it's obvious. And that means with this reform we will, should have established our global legitimacy beyond the question. Uh, in the process, we protected the quota and voting shares of low-income countries, and non-trivially, European members agreed voluntarily to give up two chairs on our 24-member executive board at the time that the 2010 reform becomes operational with the, an agreed goal that that would happen by 2012 next year. Non-trivial, and finally, uh, reform of the International Monetary and Finance Committee, Financial Committee that many, I expect in this audience, so you're familiar with this, to increase direct ministerial engagement in the decisions uh, of, the, of the fund. And as you may know, we've recently, uh, the IMFC chairmanship was recently taken over, uh, passed to uh, Minister, Finance Minister Tarman of uh, Singapore, an extremely able and widely respected leader who I'm sure is going to be able to uh, increase the uh, direct involvement of the uh, IMFC in decision making in the fund. That's the fund. Now let's talk about not the fund but the policy cooperation through the G20. This I think I can go through quickly. You're familiar with some of it but maybe not. you won't have seen it in the way I'm going to present it. I'm going to use as the, as the presentational device the five summits that have taken place so far of the new G20 leaders process. The first, of course, here in Washington in November 2008. That was the first time the G20 leaders had ever met. Uh, I'll never forget the night, uh, the opening night reception in the White House. Uh, there were, I think, 24 or 25 heads of government or heads of state. It occurred to me that probably wasn't very usual. I asked the uh, 
the staff at the White House. When was the last time so many heads of state had been in the White House at the same time? And they said, as far as they could tell, never. Uh, and yet, there's a tendency to take this for granted. Uh, but it shouldn't be taken for granted. It's uh, something novel. What was agreed in Washington to create this process? An agreement that they needed a broader policy response, closer macroeconomic cooperation. They needed to strengthen financial markets and regulatory regimes and appended an action plan and agreed uh, to meet in London in April. By that time, in April, the, uh, although we didn't know it at the time, the global economy was starting to uh, uh, level off and, and uh, uh, progress. But as you, I'm sure, all remember, it was, seemed a very frightening time in which there were concerns of the prospect of a really serious and deep, down, deep and extended downturn. What was decided in London? that a global crisis required a global solution, a cooperative solution, not an individual solution, and that we would conduct economic policies cooperatively. The result was the famous agreement on providing a trillion dollars worth of additional support and resources for the IMF, the endorsement for our new lending instruments, uh, support uh, for other international financial institutions, and an agreement on massive uh, policy stimulus, both from the budgetary side and from the monetary side. Did it have an effect? It certainly did. Can we look back and think that that was uh, unprecedented and successful policy cooperation? I think there's a reasonable case that the answer is yes. And then we look forward to Pittsburgh in September of 2009. Uh, what was done in Pittsburgh. By that time, it was clear the global economy was growing. We'd averted the worst. There was recognition that cooperation had been effective, both in, in, in direct effect, but in perception as well. The challenge in Pittsburgh was how do we sustain that sense of cooperation going forward into the recovery phase? First, there was an agreement there, these are taken from the communiques, that the G20 decided that it was to be the premier forum for international cooperation. And importantly, they agreed on something called the Framework for Strong, Sustainable, and Balanced Growth that was to provide the blueprint for policy cooperation in the recovery. Next. We have some more on Pittsburgh. No, we don't. We have Toronto. Sorry. Then we move forward to Toronto. What happened between Pittsburgh and Toronto? We actually did, we did two important things, or the G20, sorry. Forget the we. The G20 did two important things that we helped them with. First, they completed the first stage of their mutual assessment process. Namely, for the first time, each of the G20 members uh, shared their medium term, three to five year economic forecasts and laid out the policy program that underpinned those forecasts. And then turned to the IMF and asked us to see if we thought those forecasts were consistent and, if, and uh, uh, credible. And we offered our uh, suggestions. And the key question was, if you will, could we do better if we acted cooperatively. Because all of these plans were laid out individually without consideration explicitly of what everyone else was doing. So the IMF was charged with asking the question, was there a better alternative, a cooperative alternative? And we showed the G20 exactly that. Here what we show is uh, basically the, ups, the green scenarios, what we call the upside scenarios, reflects full, the, uh, full policy cooperation, coordination between uh, advanced and emerging economies. And the point here is profound but, and simple. 
Policy cooperation is not based on the notion of would you make a sacrifice for the general good. This cooperation is based on the premise that if we act coherently, we can produce an outcome that is better for everybody. So the critical question is, do you believe that analysis or not? Because if you believe that analysis, that represents the incentive for cooperation. It's not because will you be a good citizen and make a sacrifice, it is will you be a good citizen for your own interest, in your own interest. And if that's the question, if you, if you, sorry, if you believe that the upside scenario exists, then the question becomes, how do you instrument it? How do you decide what it means in detail? And secondly, how do you know if you do the right thing, your partners will do it as well? Will they fulfill their commitments? It turns out when we looked at this upside scenario in Toronto, the leaders said we believe it, advised, I'm sure, by their, by their ministers and, and, and staffs and said, let's go for it. We also laid out what I call the MAP policy framework, the policy matrix, sorry, which says, does, what does this mean? Does this just, is this just words? And the answer is no. Surplus and deficit economies, advanced and emerging economies, all have broad goals that they need to accomplish if in order to reach the upside scenario for advanced economies. Surplus economies need structural reforms. Deficit economies, fiscal, con fiscal consolidation. Emerging surplus economies, rebalance demand toward domestic sources. Deficit economies, structural reform and, uh, uh, and other demand management measures. And across the board, financial repair and financial reform. There's agreement on these broad principles. There's no disagreement that this has to be done. It's simply a matter now, it was a matter of saying, now let's go turn this into specific policy uh, commitments. So then we move forward to Seoul last fall. And in Seoul, if you have uh, looked at the documentation, you will see a 49 page addendum of policy commitments individual, by country by country of the G20 economies and in this, uh, in this MAP effort. Looking forward at Seoul, it was decided that we were going to take the MAP to a new stage of now taking this to specific policy commitments and to examine in detail the commitments of, uh, of the key countries that, that com uh, uh, contribute to imbalances. And right now, we are in the process, we at the IMF, along with our G20 partners, are, ex are analyzing the uh, uh, policies of seven uh, systemically critical economies in this regard. So now, we're headed to Khan, the next G20 summit in November of this year. What will be the challenge for Khan? Well, this will be really the first part of what I would call the acid test for policy cooperation under the mutual assessment process. Between now and Khan, we will, the, the, what's called the framework working group, the deputy minister level group, is going to take a look, among other things, at IMF analysis of the seven key countries and look in context of their policy commitments and offer their judgment and seek, com seek revised commitments towards implementing the policies that have been promised in the interest of achieving the upside scenario. That's going to produce something called the Khan uh, Action Plan. But there's another aspect that makes this novel, not only the degree of interaction and specificity, but also a commitment to what we could call a repeated exercise, a repeated game, namely. It's not just the promises, but a mechanism in which the G20 uh, participants will go back and look and, at the implementation 
to see whether their partners have done what they were supposed to do, to examine the development subsequently, and readjust action plans according to, uh, to developments. Is this all going to work? I don't know. Has it been tried before? Well, you can say, yeah, we tried this, we tried that. I don't think anything quite like this has ever existed. Is it going to solve all problems quickly? No, it's not intended to. Never, it's, that's not realistic. Can it make a difference? Well, let's give, it a, let's give it a try. And I hope an audience like this will recognize both the importance of this, uh, of this initiative, but also the need to provide political support, analytical support, intellectual support. If there are no expectations, there's no cost to failure. Uh, it's, I think, for an audience like this, I hope that you will be paying attention and uh, uh, derive, your, certainly, your own uh, independent conclusions. You're all perfectly capable of it. But if you uh, come out the same way I do, I hope that as influential a group as this will create expectations of success that, uh, by their existence, create costs of failure. Now, there's one piece missing I didn't discuss. Isn't that nice? Uh, there's one piece missing I haven't discussed, and I just want to mention without uh, going into great detail because I could give a whole lecture on this, and that is the process of financial sector reform. And I simply want to point out that under the uh, auspices of the, uh, uh, of the G20, there are three, uh, three important strains underway. One is, well, one is simply the creation of the Financial Stability Board, which was decided, uh, uh, requested, I should say, uh, by the G20 leaders in London, their London summit. What's, what's important here? By adding the G20 membership, or those G20 members not already members of the pre-existing Financial Stability Forum, we brought a whole nother set of important and potentially very important countries to the table to discuss financial sector uh, reform. It was no longer a rich man's club, and even a restricted rich man's club. Now it's a global club. They've agreed there are four pillars of financial sector reform. Uh, really, only one has been getting a, not a, a substantial public attention, and that's regulatory reform. In fact, many people, when they think of financial reform, think they mean regulatory reform. But we concluded that supervision, weakness in supervision, was every bit as important as weakness in, uh, in regulations in bringing on the financial crisis. There's a relatively little known report, a group called the Senior Supervisors Group, which is essentially supervisors from the G10 countries, that uh, under the auspice of the New York Fed conducted their own post-mortem on the crisis. Uh, their two reports uh, present a chilling reading because they say that many of the largest international financial institutions had risk management structures that were simply inadequate to the risks they were taking. In their follow-up uh, analysis, that group said, and very little has changed. Brings to mind some very obvious questions. One, what happened to market discipline? Where were boards of directors? What was senior management doing? How could we have had in place Manage, risk management structures inadequate to deal with the risks you were taking. After all, the, market, the uh, governance discipline within the financial institution was in their own self-interests. Did it mean you couldn't rely on self-interest to provide adequate control, risk control? But then obviously, if it was evident to supervisors after the fact that risk management techniques were inadequate to the risk being taken, Shouldn't that have been evident ex ante as well? So uh, we think what's needed is a strengthened supervisory uh, uh, function, not just regulatory function. More needs to be done. What else did we learn? We learned we had inadequate resolution mechanisms for failing institutions. This is the part of let's call this too important to fail. <laughs> 
that we need a way to do, we need mechanisms to do away with too important to fail. But here's the difficult part. We've seen how the failure of one, frankly, medium-sized firm, medium to small-sized firm, Lehman Brothers, created ripples across the world that have not yet been resolved. And part of the difficulty because they operated in multiple jurisdictions. How do you resolve important institutions operating in multiple jurisdictions? This is fiendishly complicated and uh, work is just getting underway. This will take a long time to reach international agreement on how to deal with these potential problems. But if you can't deal with those problems, you haven't dealt with too important to fail. And finally, an important element where we have made progress is the assessment of the implementation of new standards, and that's the mandatory FSAPs and the, the uh, peer review process separately. Peer, there's a peer review process within the FSB. That's where everybody talks to each other about how they're doing. That's always good. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell your partners that you think they're not doing so well. So that's why you have independent assessment. That's the IMF's FSAP, Financial Sector Assessment Program. It's an independent expert view to come in and say, uh, here's what an independent uh, view looks like. Finally, we all know uh, that uh, there's uh, hope for what is termed macroprudential policies to help increase the stability of the financial system. Uh, in a word, as we all know, I, again, this is an expert crowd uh, uh, audience, that the traditional view of uh, financial regulations focus on, instru on instruments and institutions, and macroprudential needs to think about how the global economy affects the stability of the financial system and uh, vice versa. So this is work that I didn't want to uh, let go by because this is continually being driven forward through the G20 process. Final topic, very, very briefly. So we have the G20 and we have the IMF. The G20 has produced uh, some impressive results and remains a vehicle for providing critical high-level, high heads of state level, leaders level, impetus for cooperation and reform. But it has some weaknesses. One is legitimacy. There are 20 members, actually a few more than that, but that's not, we not quibble. Uh, that's not a global institution. And the choice of membership is rather arbitrary. So there's an issue of legitimacy. And if we're dealing, if the uh, group is dealing with difficult issues that it is, uh, inevitably, honest folks will have different ideas. They're not always going to agree. How are you able to forge a decision on what to do that is accepted as, as uh, 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 compelling by even those who don't agree with it? Well, there's no voting rule the G20 operates by consensus. So inevitably limits the ability to make difficult decisions. The IMF is a global institution, 187 member countries. Everybody's in. And we have voting rules that are, as I said, now have global legitimacy. The relative voting share has been, uh, has been altered to importantly reflect economic weight. The IMF can reach, an organization like the IMF can reach decisions even when they're difficult and the participants can view them as fairly arrived at. So in the, as we look forward, we have to think about the issue of convergence between these institutions. Perhaps they will coexist in their ex current form. They have slightly different, they have a different focus perhaps a different purpose. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have to think whether over the long run, if you look at the G20 finance ministers and alongside them the IMFC ministers, you will find that a great number of them, the majority of them, are in both groups. Uh, so this is an ambiguity in global governance even if we decide that this process of cooperation
will have been advanced in an important way by the G20. So I've tried to lay it out for you uh, in some uh, detail. First, what the elemental challenges uh, of the uh, economic situation in broad terms are, uh, how they've been addressed, they're being addressed in a structural way by the IMF, how they're being addressed in a very potentially innovative way, an important way by the G20, uh, how these strands of efforts, in fact, are, oops, are coherent and mutually supportive, and if they succeed, will create important questions for global governance uh, as we look to the years ahead. It's a challenging moment. There are no, I know there are many specific challenging cases that we could talk about and I'll be happy to talk about later. But at the same time, it strikes me this is a moment of great promise and great opportunity to move forward the process of global economic and financial policy cooperation. That's certainly one of the principal goals of the Peterson Institute and that's why it's such a great honor and pleasure to be able to come here today to discuss these issues with you and to be able to have the great and to have the great honor of delivering the 10th Nearcos Foundation lecture. Thank you very much.